In this video, I will explain how and why the government behaves the way it does in 1984, because this reflects the fundamental questions that concern the main character, Winston Smith, who asks in his diary, I understand how, I do not understand why. Now, the how is a series of very oppressive measures, and I will outline these first, and then I'll cover the reasons why the government acts as they do. And these reasons are profoundly shocking. Following a worldwide nuclear war in the 1950s, the world has been divided into three main blocks, Oceania, Eurasia and East Asia, with a fourth area, you can see marked in grey, that often changes hands as one or the other block takes temporary control of it. Now, Oceania is governed by the party, and what we learn is that the population comprises three groups. The inner party, about 2% of the population, are the top layer of society. They're described as the brain of the state. The outer party, about 13% of the population, are bureaucrats and administrators like Winston Smith. They're described as the hands of the state. And the remaining 85% are the proletariat, or proles, who are described as natural inferiors, who must be kept in subjection, like animals. Now, the party believes that any major threat to its rule would come from the inner or outer party members, because they're educated. So these are the groups that are the focus for government control, and the state controls them in four ways. It controls their behaviour by monitoring them 24 hours a day. There are two-way telescreens in every apartment and at every office, so there are cameras and microphones wherever a person goes. In fact, as Winston puts it, you had to live in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard and every movement scrutinised. In addition, they're reminded that they are being watched by large posters around the city that say, Big Brother is watching you. The party also controls facts by controlling what people are allowed to watch and listen to and by continually rewriting history. In fact, rewriting history is Winston's job. And manipulation of the past is essential to make people believe that the party has always been right. The importance of this form of control can also be seen by the fact that the word past is mentioned 108 times in this book. And it's why one of the party slogans is, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. The party also controls words. It knows that people cannot think without words. So it's created a new way of speaking called new speak, which involves destroying all unnecessary words. As Winston's colleague Syme says, don't you see that the whole aim of new speak is to narrow the range of thought. So the aim is that in the end, no one will be able to even think something that the party doesn't want them to think because the words won't exist. The fourth way is via control of the emotions. The party discourages love between men and women. It discourages sex unless it is for the specific purpose of creating children. And it discourages children from building relationships with their families. In fact, children are taught to spy on their families and to report them to the authorities, undermining the traditional bonds of love between parent and child. This is the world that Winston Smith is forced to live in and shows how the state controls inner and outer party members. But the more important question is why do they do it? Now, the first indications of why can be seen when O'Brien, a member of the inner party, gives Winston a banned book. It is written by Emmanuel Goldstein, who was a former leader of the party and is now regarded as a traitor. Goldstein's character is most likely based upon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary leader who was exiled by Stalin. And now the book has the rather imposing title of The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism. Now, Goldstein's book reveals that in all societies, there were always three levels of people, the high, the middle, and the low. Historically, the aim of the high is to remain where they are, while the aim of the middle 
is to replace the high. The low, however, rarely have any aims, so they tend to live in societies created by those above them. In these circumstances, the high remain in power until the middle become discontented, at which time the middle enlist the help of the low by claiming that they're fighting for equality for all, and once the middle defeat the high, they become the new high, but the low are not liberated and remain in poverty. But by the 20th century, this type of hierarchical arrangement was coming under threat from industrialization because machines could theoretically create excess wealth, and that wealth could then be distributed to more and more people. Now, in theory, this sounds good, but it threatens the elite with destruction because wealth was one of the key ways of establishing that they were better than everyone else. And they were important because they were capable of earning wealth. I mean, if everyone had enough wealth to be comfortable, to own a house, a car, and have enough to eat, then the most important form of inequality would have disappeared. And then, as Goldstein puts it, the great mass of human beings would become literate, they would learn to think for themselves, and they'd sooner or later realise that the privileged minority had no function, and they would sweep it away. So that's why Goldstein writes, in the long run, a hierarchical society was only possible on a basis of poverty and ignorance. Now, of course, this was also true of the other two great blocs, Eurasia and East Asia. And so it was decided to arrest any progress towards equality and to freeze history at the moment when they held power. But how would they hold on to power when no government had succeeded in doing so in the past? Well, there are three main factors. The first was to use war as a means to destroy excess wealth so that it couldn't be distributed more widely. They did this because, having dropped hundreds of atomic bombs on each other in the 1950s, the three powers realised that winning any future war was impossible. They would just simply destroy each other with more atomic weapons. And they were actually pretty equally matched in other ways. So they came up with the idea of perpetual war, which meant that the majority of people were kept in poverty but couldn't rebel because they were constantly being bombed and living in fear of the enemy, either Eurasia or East Asia. The second idea is the idea of oligarchical collectivism, which actually sounds much more complicated than it is. An oligarchy simply means government by the few, and these few, as we've heard, like to take as many of the resources as they can. This would normally create envy and rebellion amongst the middle classes. So to avoid this, the party decided to take all property into collective ownership. So this means the state owns everything, and no one owns any private property. Now this is essentially a sleight of hand move that allows the governing elite to say that although they have nice places to live and other benefits, they don't own those things. So that's why Goldstein writes, it had long been realised that the only secure basis for oligarchy, which is government by the few, is collectivism. Wealth and privilege are most easily defended when they are possessed jointly. So, although property was now actually concentrated in the hands of far fewer people than ever before, the new owners were the state instead of a mass of individuals. And the party was able to do this because it was seen as an act of collectivism. So oligarchy continues by dressing it up as taking property into public ownership. Now, the third critical element was the availability of technology to enable 24-hour surveillance of the citizens, where no previous government had possessed this power. And in addition, they could transmit official propaganda and close all other channels of communication. Now, this means that the possibility of enforcing not only complete obedience to the will of the state, but complete uniformity of opinion on all subjects now existed for the first time. This is a critical 
point. It is the combination of monitoring plus ensuring people only see and hear what the government wants them to see and hear that allows them total control. So to recap, Goldstein says there are only four ways in which a ruling group can fall from power. One, conquered by a foreign power. Two, it governs so inefficiently that the masses are stirred to revolt. Three, it allows a strong and discontented middle class to come into being. Four, it loses its own self-confidence and willingness to govern. Now, the first three of these in 1984 are not really a threat. First, the major powers had decided to maintain a state of perpetual war and didn't try and conquer each other. Second, the masses are ignorant, they will never revolt. Third, the war has eroded wealth, so there is little or no chance that the middle classes will become discontented, because they don't really exist. So the only issue is the fourth group, the ruling class, and the possibility that they might become discontented. And the answer to that problem is education. It is a problem of continuously moulding the consciousness, both of the directing group and the larger executive group that lies immediately below it. That larger executive group includes Winston Smith, and this is how and why he becomes a target for the thought police, as he's a threat to the party's rule and must be re-educated. Against this background, the everyday reality of why the party seeks power is stated by O'Brien as he tortures Winston. The party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power. And the purpose of re-education isn't just getting people to agree with the party. It's about tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. And what O'Brien then tells Winston is shocking in its truthfulness. There will be no loyalty except loyalty towards the party. There will be no love except the love of Big Brother. There will be no laughter except the laugh of triumph over a defeated enemy. There will be no art. No literature, no science. And this is precisely the situation Winston finds himself in at the end of the book, sitting in a soulless cafe, drinking gin, watching Oceania defeat enemy forces and dreaming of the day the party will execute him whilst thinking that he'd won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. So I hope this video has given you some insights into how and why the party keeps control in Oceania and it helps you to get greater enjoyment from George Orwell's 1984. Give a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and subscribe now so that you never miss any of my future posts.